Dear participants, my name is uh, Dr. Julia Zions, and I would like to welcome you at another EuroBloodNet's first day webinar. Uh, before we start, I would like to uh, inform you that uh, during the webinar, all the microphones will be uh, muted. And please be sure that your cameras um, are off to maintain better streaming quality. And if you have any questions about their presentation, please write it in the chat as at the end of the lecture, there will be a discussion. And please welcome with me today's speaker, Professor Jude Fitzgibbon, who will lead a session today on genetic predisposition to myeloid disorders and when to test it. Professor Jude Fitzgibbon is a chair in personalized center medicine at the Bart Center Cancer Institute at the Queen Mary University of London, where he has worked over the past 20 years and is a member of the AML and Lymphoma National Cancer Research Institute Science Subgroup in UK. In his research, Professor Fitzgibbon focuses on understanding and translating information on the molecular pathogenesis of hematological malignancies. His research team was the first to report specific mutations in familial AMLs, demonstrating that recurrence of disease in these patients represents the novel episodes of disease rather than true relapse. In his work, Professor Fitzgibbon also focuses on developing guidelines on how to best manage this high-risk group of patients and on identifying novel gene variants implicated in inherited myeloid malignancies. Professor Fitzgibbon, the floor is yours. Brilliant. So really welcome to, to everybody to this Thursday webinar. And thank you very much to Julia and her team for the invitation. Just want to say that I'm a, I'm a research scientist. So we work in London probably about five minutes away from uh, St. Paul's Cathedral. So, you know, very much centre uh, in London itself. And I hope it's going to be quite a, a maybe a, a chit-chatty type of talk rather than just a lot of information to, to, to pull together. So hopefully you have uh, an interesting 30 minutes ahead. Hmm. Trying to move it forward. Let me see. <clears throat> So I have no conflict of interest, and I think Julie's already kind of gone through this, but we're going to have probably about a 30-minute presentation, 15 minutes for questions and answers, and, uh, you know, the other kind of details that, that Julia described here for you. I think the learning objectives, really what I'd like to get across today is a kind of a Swiss a whistle stop tour of what familial acute myeloid leukemia, myeloid dysplasia actually is. I'd like to give you an example. I think an example we've worked on now for, for some time, but actually shows the simplicity, but also the complexity and the importance of understanding and identifying this group of, of, of patients early. And these are, for example, uh, patients with a familial mutation transcription factor, CIP alpha. And also a, a, new, a new manuscript recently that we published in Nature Communications identifying new disease genes in, in this particular setting. For those of you who mightn't be so familiar with AML and MDS, really, it's a rapid growth of abnormal cells that kind of build up in the bone marrow and blood and interfere with normal blood cells. It's, it's essentially mutations in the leukemic stem cell blocking differentiation uh, and increasing proliferation. Um, and what we're beginning to see is that these familial cases probably represent maybe, maybe as much as 10 to 12 percent of the cases that uh, a hematologist might meet in the clinic on a day-to-day -day basis, but they come in different flavors. And I think what I'd like to say really is that, you know, we haven't done so well in identifying these cases or recognizing them. And that's because of the fragmented nature of hematology where, you know, every, every hematologist, you know, sees their group of patients. Um, and it's, it's a busy time when the patient comes in and needs to be treated or is diagnosed with AML. And, and I think it's important therefore that that we, we try and uh, better understand the natural history of these diseases, the frequency of diseases. And also I think we have to think very carefully because there is often apprehension, not just on the patient, but actually on the, on the treating physician regarding germline testing, the interpretation of results, uh, 
you know, and and you know, these patients are are worried uh, and and understandably worried given the disease they have. That that sometimes clinicians might feel that well, why put them through more worry in relationship to germline testing and specific implications that might be there. And I think we need to address this because the information that we're getting now is is becoming more informative. So a little bit about what AML-MDS actually is. Well, uh, as you said, we, we all know it's it's a sporadic disease primarily, but there are rare occurrences of familial cases. And you know, if, if you're a pediatrician or if you're an adult hematologist, your views on the frequency might vary or your understanding of these the complexity might vary too. I think simplicity, you could say that familial, if you wanted to kind of identify it or have a query in your mind would be two or more affected individuals in the same family. There's a certain amount of autosomal dominant inheritance, younger age of onset. And I think what's been key is the recognition by the, the WHO and the classification of these, this disease entity in the revised WHO classification in 2016. Um, but the recognition of these inherited forms are tricky for a number of different reasons. Uh, first of all, you have to, patients themselves won't be aware of their predisposition, the clinical heterogeneity of the disease. So it can come in, in many different shapes and forms. It can be pure. Uh, the, only, the only visual effect is, is the myeloid malignancy, or it can, be, it can be part of a syndrome. And I think there's an absence of customized diagnostics and clinical guidelines. I also have some work going on upstairs by, by, by a neighbor. So I'm very sorry if you're hearing some background noise. I think what's disappointing to me is this. The ASH is the American Society of Hematology. And you know, in, in one of their, their documents recently, you know, they, they had a wonderful uh, two page spread on putting mutation testing and myeloid malignancies to the test. There was no mention of familial myeloid disease. And so in a way you can see not only is there a kind of a dearth of understanding at the, you know, at, on the ground level, but actually within those people who, who should know better, I think that there, there's a focus on sporadic disease when actually I think you need to combine both ideas together. And these are a large number of loci that are actually been associated with familial myeloid dysplasia and acute myeloid leukemia. Starting, as we all probably know, with the RUNS1 mutations, you know, RUNS1 um, transcription factor. And everybody here would probably know that these are linked with familial platelet disorder and a propensity to AML. We showed uh, mutations in CIP alpha uh, around 2004 were familial. And you can see then over the last several years, there's been an explosion based on next generation sequencing and the identification of several new loci. And probably many of these loci are occurring in, in a very small number of individuals, not, not very frequent at all. But, but I think mutations in, in the, the SAMD9 family are interesting. Mutations in DDX41 are also interesting, uh, especially DDX41 because there's an overlap between sporadic disease and familial disease. Now, the other thing what we have to bear with is, is the fact that from a predisposition perspective, we're dealing with, with a situation whereby we have a lot of known data that we're, we're convinced about, we're certain about. Then there's also data that, that there's, the evidence is pretty good, but it's emerging from research. And then there's other data that, that really we're, we're pulling together and trying to see, is this data ready for prime time? Should it be tried to be incorporated into the clinical management of patients? And so you can, you can kind of subdivide the, the, patient, the genes into these different groups. But also you can, you can look at the loci based on the function of the genes that are actually mutated. So you've got a lot of DNA binding proteins, telomerase regulators, inflammatory response or, or other functions. And what you also begin to see is that, you know, it would be nice if you could just box every, every gene, every mutation into a kind of a simple box. But there's, there's a huge overlap between the mutations that are mutated in in AML MDS and, and those rela and, and related syndromes with AML MDS and also other 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 kind of hematological malignancies. So for example, the Bomar failure syndrome. And this is a, a really wonderful paper by uh, the French group led by Bluto and uh, I think Jean Soulier and 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 where they uh, generated a landscape study in relationship to Bomar failure syndromes and the specific mutations. 
And so this is, I think, particularly important to keep to keep in mind that that actually there's an overlap in phenotype, an overlap in complexity, and and therefore certain genes that you might associate with with other phenotypes actually can uh, be mutated, albeit you know at a low frequency in some of these familial cases that you see. Also, I think it's important to 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 look and see that the mutations. Um, just move something. Yes, mutations that, that the mutations that occur in familial MDSAML typically also occur in sporadic disease. So you know you've got your mutations in runs. We all know that they occur in normal karyotype AML at a reasonably high frequency. Um, GATA2 mutations are very frequent in pediatric cases with monosomy 7. Some are sporadic and some are germline. Um, DDX41 is, is, is a kind of a new kid on the block. Uh, it's been around now two or three years, but people are initially uh, recognized it as having a germline DDX41 mutation, but then a, 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 a subsequent acquired mutation on the other allele of DDX41. I think it's becoming recognized as a, as a feature of sporadic disease as well. Uh, and then other mutations. But I think it's important to keep in mind that there's this overlap between the two. And that's why when you're thinking of targeted panels or generating genetic data, do you, you know, do you, should we be having a single panel that looks at both sporadic and familial genes? Or, or should we have two panels, one looking at familial and one looking at sporadic acquired mutations as we try and integrate the data that we have into clinical practice? And what I'd like to say really is that, you know, if, if we've pulled together a very heterogeneous bunch of patients from maybe 20 or 30 different groups around the world, primarily in Europe, and that's allowed us to look for mutations and define the mutation frequency of the known loci, but also to say, well, actually, when you've tested all the known loci, there's quite a few that you, you can't actually find a mutation in, so that there's still quite a lot of novel loci there to be identified. And so we'd say we probably about 40% of the families that we've collected, over 100 at the present time, um, about 40, and we, we don't actually know what the driver mutations or the driver events are actually in those cases. Now you might say, well, this is all great. You know, why the hell are we going to all this bother of trying to understand the importance of identifying these new genes? Well, clearly from the family's perspective, it's important because you need to be able to manage patients and their families effectively, knowing that there's a germline mutation and a predisposition, probably with high penetrance, to getting a myelide malignancy. Surveillance of, of, the, of asymptomatic individuals is important. And also, I think what you begin to see, you know, when you, if you were to search PubMed and say kind of donor-derived donor -derived malignancies, there's for probably all the mutations or all the common mutations there, there's evidence in the literature of donor-derived acute myeloid leukemia, myeloid dysplasia following transplant. And so therefore, in those cases, you know, the selection of donor has, has been, you know, you, you, you chose the best donor, but it just so happens that you've got a, an asymptomatic individual who is a carrier. And once the, the transplant has, has, has effectively worked, those individuals still have that predisposition gene and go on to develop a new episode of uh, leukemia or, or MDS. So from a management point of view, there's all these issues to take into account. Also, I think many of the patients are young patients, so that, that, that there's also going to be family planning issues in relationship to subsequent family members. There's also broader implications because, you know, we, we can start thinking about disease latency and penetrance. You know, why, why do some individuals uh, in a family present at the age of two with acute myeloid leukemia and others might be 40? Why you might have three or four affected children, but uh, the carrier parent mightn't be affected at all. So penetrance is an issue. But they all start with the same starting point. They all start with the same germline mutation. And then that journey is just different in the different patients. You see clustering of the same types of secondary mutations within individual pedigrees. That's interesting. You know, is it possible that there's a kind of a host effect whereby for some reason there's a bias towards what secondary you, you mutations you actually get within a pedigree? The order by which mutations arise, because we can start with, we know what the first mutation is if we know the mutation and the gene. 
Um, and also these genes are not mutated, a proportion of them are not mutated in sporadic AML. So clearly it's telling us something new about the biology of AML MDS that you won't get by looking at sporadic disease. Now you might say, oh, but he works on this. So, you know, clearly he's going to kind of make a good story about it. Actually, all these issues are nice questions. The nice questions that must tell us something about the evolution of the disease. The evolution from pre-malignant disease or latency uh, and provide us with, with, with new ways of thinking about these diseases that might be important in how we can develop better therapies. And really for me, it started about, oh, 16 or 17 years ago when, um, and this was nice as a, can ask the question there. This was this was what was what was nice here was was that we we within two weeks of each other we got two patients attended uh, our hematology clinic at Barnes Medical School in London, and this boy was thirty years of age and his daughter and his sister was eighteen years and they both had AML, and at the time going back sixteen seventeen years we were very fortunate because. There was only NPM and FLIT and CYP alpha were the only three genes that were known to be mutated in AML. So we screened those and we identified uh, specific mutations in, I'm gonna get an arrow, I think. Um, we, we identified mutations in the N-terminal portion of the, of the CYP alpha transcription factor that was uh, 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 germline. And people might be aware of what CYP alpha actually does. So this is the transcription factor. It has two different start sites. And what happens is that you can generate two types of protein. You can generate a 42 kilodalton IF form or a 30 kilodalton form. And the mutations that are germline in about 95% of cases have a mutation in the N terminal portion of the protein. And what, the, what the, the, the protein then does is that it starts using the internal ATG site. So it generates more of the 30 kilodalton protein. Um, and then for overt disease to actually occur, you seem to need to get a second bilelic mutation, a mutation in the other allele. CYP alpha is an intronless gene, so it's very easy then to be able to distinguish between whether a mutation is present on one or the other allele. Um, and this was interesting because this was one of the first examples after runs of there being inherited pure myeloid malignancy. Um, and these individuals were treated in a very standard way. They all went into remission. Um, there's been another affected individual in the pedigree sense. So there's four affected individuals, and, you know, and they all did fairly well using very, very standard uh, approaches to treatment. So when we look at the mutations in, in relationship to CYP alpha, when we start pulling together as many of these familial cases as possible, what you can see is that the germline mutations all appear to occur in the N-terminal pro portion of the, of the protein. Uh, and then for overt disease to occur, you actually get acquired mutations so that you get a, an effect of the second allele. So these mutations occur together. And what we can then do is we can, we can start pulling together and generating clinical timelines for each of the individual patients. And that gives us a flavor of the clinical heterogeneity that happens in cases with these familial CYP alpha mutations. Um, and, and I think that what, what, what we can see here in, in this slide, and, and I'm going to take a little bit of time just in case it's, it's tricky for anybody, but these are Kaplan-Meier survival curves. And what we're doing here is we're comparing the overall survival of patients with familial disease, the green line, compared to patients that have a double mutant CYP alpha mutation, which in the, in the sporadic setting of AML is linked with reasonably good outcome, hence the 50, 55% outcome survival here, versus patients with single mutant that have more of a standard outcome. And what you can see, probably not surprisingly, is that patients that have a double mutant are, uh, are the same as familial cases who have a double mutant. Um, they both do exactly the same, even though in, in the familial case, one is, one is germline and, and the other is acquired. Probably what's of particular interest, and, I, and I'm, when, I, when I present this to, to many, at many different talks, a lot of people don't understand the trick here before I tell them. So maybe people can, can ask themselves a, a quick question here. But when you look, at, when you look at, at first relapse in these individuals, you can see that, that once patients relapse, 
they relapse quickly, whether you're in the sporadic setting where you have a, a second, sec, uh, the disease returns. And essentially in the single mutant and the double mutant, these patients typically relapse quickly um, and, and don't do so well. The familial cases seem to do better. And relapse seems to take a, a longer time. Typically it's over two years before the patients actually relapse. And so the clinical fellow, Kieran Tuana, who's actually working on the project as part of our clinical research fellowship, she was thinking, well, how could we explain this? And it turns out that it's a very simple uh, reason that these patients actually relapse later than their sporadic counterparts. That's because the patients are cured of their initial disease, but they're predisposed to new leukemic episodes because they have that germline predisposition in all their cells. And how do we know that? Well, we know that because typically a diagnosis, you have one type of mutation, but when you relapse, you, remain, you retain the germline mutation, but you've acquired a new one. So essentially, you don't quite retain any of the acquired mutations that are present in the first leukemia, but you have the germline mutation and a completely new bunch, including a new CIP-alpha mutation. So therefore, you've actually cured the disease. You've done a fantastic job as a, as a hematologist, but they're just predisposed to getting a new round of malignancy. And so the collective experience, you know, and it can change, but, you know, there's clearly chemotherapy alone, you know, can, can work well but there's a high frequency of late chemosensitive relapses. Um, and so that the suggestion is that in that stage, maybe allogeneic transplantation would be, would be beneficial in preventing further new episodes of the disease to occur. But people can be salvaged in relapse because it's not frank relapse, it's actually a new episode of disease. I think we would suggest that it's worthwhile performing germline testing in sporadic cases of patients, maybe not even less than 40, maybe less than 50 years of age. And because across all the series that I've seen and the, day, and the, and the patients that we have, have uh, at our centre uh, or who've, who've been referred to our centre, I think that, that the age of onset is typically always less than 50. Period counselling is, is important to understanding the implications of having these types of mutations. Um, you know, and you have to recognize and consider the individual's choice. And I think that's very important. And I, and I think that's one of the reasons that some uh, physicians, when they're treating uh, familial diseases and they know about specific mutations, maybe are reluctant a little bit to, to go down that route and just treat as it would be a sporadic disease. But clearly there's a need to, to think about, especially if you're contemplating a, a bone marrow transplant from a, a related uh, donor to, to to screen potential sibling donors because there has been two or three episodes of donor-derived uh, AML arising in, in this patient population. So the, the last part of the talk, I really wanted to try and talk a little bit about identifying new genes in familial MDS and AML cases. And you know, if if anybody listening today has has, has some of these patients in their clinic, I'd be very happy to to talk and discuss them with you but also I can guide you to different groups around the world who are actively exploring and working on these, these particular diseases and would also like to, to research or, or discuss uh, the individual cases with yourselves. So here we've got a very, all postdocs, they're all very talented, but this is a particularly talented postdoc called Anna Ria Macken from, from Spain who, who works with us in, in London. Um, on the complex genetic landscape of familial MDS AML. Um, and we had a cohort of 86 cases and quite a diverse clinical background in relationship to these patients. You know, they, they can come in all shapes and sizes, either pure AML, pure MDS, or actually can have other uh, hematological malignancies uh, linked to them. But, but essentially our, our inclusion criteria was that two or more individuals with hematological malignancy of myelite origin, one of which was AML uh, or MDS. And I think that, it, that what's important is, is I'm going to, to move something on my screen a second. Um, that's right. So they can come in two flavors. So let's divide them up into two groups. The first group is we know the mutations. We've screened for the known knowns and we found the mutations that are there. And the second are the families without established germline mutation. So there's something novel there to actually find and, and, and see what's important. 
It's also important, I think, in, in the UK, when we started this work about four years ago, five years ago, there wasn't, a, um, there wasn't a diagnostic test available. And so we set up a diagnostic test uh, in Birmingham, the West Midlands Regional Genetic Laboratory, uh, led by Joanna Mason. Um, and they've set up genetic testing. And actually, they've, they've shifted over the last year or so to whereby they're combining the mutations that are part of the familial panel uh, to go into their um, somatic panel so that both are done simultaneously. And I think this is quite important and, it, and it's the right way to go. But, but, but clearly, the information, a lot of the information that's actually uh, useful might necessarily be important. Um, but, but I think that combining the data gives the same timeliness in relationship to having the information at your disposal. The difficulty with having different panels and the need, of course, to have a, a germline control means that sometimes there can be a delay, especially if there's only rare use of a particular panel in having that information made available to you. So we had 49 families where we actually knew what the germline variant was and, and they kind of fall together, they fall together here across a multitude of different genes and different mutations. And these are what some of the, the families can look like. And, and I just wanted to highlight kind of the, 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 the complexity. So we, we've just spoken about germline mutations in CIP-alpha that occur at the N-terminal, but there's also very rare, there's probably three or four in the literature of C-terminal mutations. And these are very different. First of all, they're different because um, there seems to be reduced penetrance. So therefore, there's a Quite a, there's a carriers in here, but there's only two individuals who are affected with AML and DS. Um, and in this case, they acquire N-terminal mutations to actually allow for overt disease to occur. I think why I threw up the RUNS1 pedigrees, first of all, there's a really wonderful RUNS1 foundation uh, set up in America by uh, an individual who's affected, who's trying to research this and find new cures and therapies for uh, understanding the uh, the RUNS1 phenotype, but also that transition from uh, RUNS1 familial plate disorder to acute mild leukemia. I think what I want to show about the, the, the RUNS1 is the fact that, that in a lot of cases you can screen the gene and you won't find any mutation. And that's because in our hands about 30% of the patients that are actually present, 30% of the patients have deletions in the RUNS1 gene itself that's across the whole gene. And that won't be picked up by a simple PCR. You have to do a kind of a copy number analysis or a, or a low pass screen or, or something that will look for gross changes uh, to allow you to pick those up. I think that there, that's quite an important test and, and probably people before hadn't appreciated how frequently this loss of function mutations actually are. This is another pedigree. So um, we had a um, we had a European Hematology Association researcher called Chaba Bother who came from Hungary for a few years. He works at Semmelweis University and he brought this pedigree to our attention uh, where this is mom and mom has had four offspring, all of which have familial plated disorder and went on to develop AML. She was asymptomatic herself. And they all have the same and carry the same mutation. What's interesting here is that in addition to having the RUNS1 mutation, they've all or three out of four out of the family have acquired mutations in the, the, Jack, the Jack stat as their secondary mutations. And I think that's interesting because a little bit like our own CIP alpha cases, you know, where we're aware that they've acquired GATA2 mutations in, in families at a high frequency. Uh, as with sporadic cases, GATA2 mutations is a secondary mutation. Here, uh, you're seeing mutations in Jack clustering within the family. And I don't really have any evidence for it, but what does that mind, what might that suggest? Well, it might suggest that, that you're predisposed in some way to the secondary mutation that you actually get. So are you being driven down a certain route? In this case, Jack is your, is your, is your second lesion that actually gives you a certain phenotype. And so that, that's quite an interesting uh, idea that, that in a way that the, the primary mutation is present, but then there's something about the host genetics potentially that's driving the acquisition of what that secondary mutation would be. Because if you look at other RUNS1 pedigrees, these other mutations are very infrequent. And here we've got three mutations in the JAK pathway uh, across four affected individuals. 
this is another pedigree. So I've just show, I've just showed you the kind of work that we do, and 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 that's not because there isn't a lot of activity in the field across several other groups. There is, but it, it's just it's it, I, I I know these families well, and 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 they, they provide little vignettes of information as to how we can think from a research perspective and how we can uh, utilize that information to see can we get a better handle on the disease. So this is a this is a multi-generation family and these are two first cousins and these two first cousins uh, had uh, myelodysplasia with monosomy 7 at a young age of around 20 to 22 or 3 and unfortunately they both died from uh, transplant related issues. About 10 years later, so I think the family decided, you know, we've, we've had enough of research. And about 10 years later, um, a 30-year-old arrived in, starting to develop symptoms herself. But they were fairly mild. Um, she had four children. And at the time, uh, the GATA2 lockets had been described. And so we were in a position where we could test for GATA2. And the first thing we could show is that her four children uh, are all wild type. So wild type configuration. So that was good news. Um, and then it was decided by the physicians treating uh, this lady, just watch and wait and we'll see. And what we've done is we've followed this lady now for about five or six years. Um, and when we started looking in relationship to her, her disease itself, what we, could, what we could see is that, is that, um, well, this is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to, to, I have to go back. Sorry. What we what we could see is that the the mild phenotype that this lady had was a reflection of monolelic expression. Um, what I want to show here in the slide is is just is just purely that from a sequencing point of view. All I'm showing is that is the fact that, that um, the asymptomatic individuals are heterozygous, so they're expressing both wild type and mutant while the symptomatic carrier is, is only expressing the mutant allele. So the wild type allele has been silenced in this case. We want to, want to show what's the mechanism by which uh, monolithic expression is happening and the mechanisms behind that. But it, this, is, this is for a particular type of mutation in GATA2. Um, and also the, the fact that we're, we're seeing this, this penetrance and the question you could ask yourself is, is there something special about these individuals? Are they protected in some way from actually going on to develop a disease or not? So the last part is really to then talk about the second group of individuals, the individuals whereby we've tested the known knowns and we haven't been able to identify any known mutation. So what do we do here? Well, the first hypothesis or the first assumption that we need to make is when maybe these patients have another mutation. Maybe they have a coding mutation that just hasn't been detected so far. We haven't been able to spot what the gene is. And so you can perform whole exome sequencing and whole exome sequencing then will give you a flavor of which coding mutation might actually be driving a disease. And this is very easy if you've kind of got a beacon. If you've got, let's say that you've got a, you take a family like we have here and we sequence multiple individuals, the whole exome sequencing data identifies, let's say, 61 germline variants. These are coding variants that, that you could all say, well, these, these could be important, these could be driving the disease. But lo and behold, you find a RUNS1 mutation. So if you find a RUNS1 mutation, you know immediately, well, RUNS1 is a very well-defined, well, very well-described transcription factor. The mutations typically occur in a certain location of the gene, in the runs one, um, uh, the run domain, or in other locations throughout the, the the protein, and you can kind of almost exclude the other sixty and say this is a runs one family. The difficulty, of course, is that when you sequence a family where you don't know uh, what the the driver mutation is, and in this case, you can sequence multiple individuals, and then we found eighty one germline variants. Now the question is, is which of those variants is likely to be the gene that's that's mutated or the gene that's causing the phenotype or causing AML MDS in the individual. And in the background, we also have to say to ourselves, but look, what's the likelihood of two sporadic cases actually happening within a pedigree at the same time? And so in some cases, 
you might screen for germline variants. You might find a bunch of those variants, but it could be that you're not looking at familial disease at all. You're looking at sporadic disease, but you're seeing multiple individuals with sporadic disease within that pedigree. It's rare, but I think it has to be considered. And we developed a kind of a criteria for filtering out genes so that we could try and home in on the genes that we felt are going to be important. And we've identified uh, 65 genes that we feel now are are potentially important and new genes that we can now start saying, can we test these? Can we see whether these are also occurring in other pedigrees around the world? And whether we can add those to the list of genes that should be routinely sequenced as part of uh, the guidance of these individuals. One of the genes in this publication, this article that we published, uh, is a mutation in a new locus called the DHX34. It's an RNA helicase and it's involved in mRNA splicing and mediates uh, messenger RNA decay. We found a mutation in four different pedigrees. And these are the specific mutations that they actually had. And in conjunction uh, with, uh, with a group in Edinburgh, we went on, we went on to actually look at the, the function of these particular mutations and were able to show that these result in loss of function mutations and appear to dampen down uh, one, they have, they have uh, a reduced function in comparison to wild type. I think the other thing that we, we're working on as well or thinking about is, is there is assumption that the mutations that you see must be important in generating the leukemic stem cell. It must be a mutation that when it's, when it's within the hemopoietic stem cell, in some way it's predisposing to the development of leukemia. But what you also have to think when, when thinking about these variants, these germline variants, that these variants are also occurring uh, in every cell. So they're not just present in the hemopoietic stem cell itself, but they're also present in all the different components of the tumor microenvironment. And there's a, a new PI working at Barts called Kevin Rupierre, um, who worked with Dominic Bonney and the Crick, and now he's his own group. And what he's doing is he's taking some of the mutations that we've identified and not only looking at the effect of the mutations on the leukemic stem cell itself or the hemopoietic stem cell using core blood models, but also looking at mesenchymal stem cells and actually looking at the effects of mesenchymal stem cells and knockdown or, or in the, the introduction of these mutations into the, into the tumor microenvironment. And then asking the question, is there a phenotypic difference if you have a mutation just in the leukemia in the hemopoietic stem cell, or if you've got combined mutations in microenvironment cells and in the hemopoietic stem cell compartment as well? All these are done in vitro. But I think the important thing to keep in mind is that the mutations that you see in the germline setting are everywhere. And therefore, we have to ask the question, is the phenotype just linked specifically to the leukemic stem cell, or is the mutation that's present in the microenvironment as well also contributing to the phenotype? And these are really a summary of the predisposing genes uh, that we've noted in familial MDS. And I, I, if anybody you know, is bothered to have a look at the paper, uh, I think the discussion, I think we spend a lot of time in in just making sure that people realize is that you know, we, we can't put a lot of weight on the individual loci or genes or variants that we've identified. I think the DHX34 might be an exception, but, but I think it's the direction of travel. It shows the complexity. It shows that we, we need to work uh, co collaboratively worldwide and pull these cases together, be more aware of them, pull the cases together and actually identify is there other loci or other genes that are mutated at a reasonably high frequency and that these individuals could be worked on together. Because I think going forward, what we need is joined up thinking across all different groups so that patients with CIP alpha or with a familial involvement are treated the same, whether you're in the UK or, or in Europe or in America. The same goes for DHX34 or DDX41, even the RUNS1 pedigrees they can be treated very differently depending on the treating physician that uh, they start off with. And, you know, my final remarks really, the take home, the take home message is, is, you know, how can we improve diagnosis and treatment and management of these cases? I think first of all, we have to be brave and it's easy for a scientist who sits in the lab and if something doesn't work, you just put it in a bin and you start the next day. In your case, if you're, if you're meeting a patient, 
you know, you're weighing up the, the, the presence of the disease and then whether there's potentially a, a familial involvement that you need to, to account for, you need to test for, and then you need to, to, to have suitable counselling uh, opportunities for that individual. 50% of the cases that you might see, we don't know what the genetic basis is. So there needs to be a research program that will allow you to potentially collect tissue from that individual and actually test it to see whether is there a novel mutation that uh, might be present in this particular family or individual that will be important going forward in the management of that family, but also in giving us a better understanding of, of uh, myeloid, myeloid, myeloid malignancies. And clearly, in addition to identifying that a variant is present, it also needs to be functionally validated so that everybody knows this mutation is important, this, this is what the mutation actually does, and how the, that might explain some of the heterogeneity both within families and between families that you see uh, with exactly the same types of gene mutations. And then I think we need to develop novel guidelines. I think the, the WHO is a fantastic start. There's several fantastic groups around the world. Lucy Godley in Chicago is, is, is one, for example. To develop novel guidelines, as with SIP alpha mutations, which can be quite simple and straightforward, but just worthwhile knowing so that you can actually be ready to, if you identify any of these individuals, you can actually treat them more effectively. So that's me done. So I just want to, to, to say some thanks to, to Ahad, who is a PhD student in the lab, who did a lot of the GATA2 work, to Hannah, who's a new recruit working with Kevin in relationship to the functional assessment of these particular mutations and what they're doing in um, the leukemic stem cell, but also are in core blood, what their effect is in core blood, but also then in relationship to, to the effect on the mesothelial stem cells. Then who's our data, data scientist, and Anna-Marie Macken, who, who essentially uh, really runs our, our somatic and our familial um, program and is a, a wonderful recruit to have in the lab. And we're funded primarily by Blood Cancer uh, UK, and we're very grateful to all the funding that they've given us over the last four to five years. So thank you very much. And I can see that there's several questions. Thank you, Professor Fitzgibbon, for this uh, great comprehensive presentation and, and, and following um, Following you, um, I kindly encourage the audience to ask questions in the chat. Okay, so so the first question is from Paola, and Paolo just just wants to to, to work out whether we we recommend germline testing of young AML patients with CIP alpha mutation, and I suppose this includes those only those with biallelic mutations. And so I think I think it, I would agree. I would say that if if you they're, they're, they're based on all the information that I have. If, if you've got a 70 year old who's come in with intermediate or normal karyotype AML, has, has um, a biallelic mutation on your somatic panel, um, you know, I don't think that there's evidence at the present time to suggest that you need to explore familial in that particular family. And that's not to say that if you took a family history and she said that she had several other. Uh, cousins or relations who had AML that you wouldn't want to explore it further. But if, if, if uh, I would tend to, to say that it's, it's younger individuals and it's only cases that have biallelic mutation. You have to be confident, therefore, that the screening and the testing that's been done is picking up biallelic mutations if they're actually there. Uh, and 95% of cases, the germline variant that you see will be uh, an end terminal mutation. So the next question, um, does finding one germline variant during the screening of a sporadic patient with myeloid require the study of the entire family? Now, this is a really excellent question. This is, a, this is an excellent question because um, the sporadic data, and we, I, we've talked extensively to Joanna Mason, who runs the one of the diagnostic testing uh, sites in the UK. And, and I think she made a very good point is that is that they, they will look at the individual mutations and then when they're sending back the results, they will give their own uh, assessment in relationship to whether a variant is pathogenic or not, whether a variant is present. And, and they can also make a, 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 an assessment on whether it's likely to be germline in some cases, depending on the tests that have been run. Um, and in some cases, a physician will come back and there will be a big discussion about what you might actually do. But in other cases, you don't hear back from the physician at all. And so clearly what I feel is that 
and we feel it probably is a group that within certain hospitals, you know, the MDT is focusing very nicely on looking at these cases and coming up and assessing them and deciding, yes, there's a familial possibility here. We need to investigate it further. We need to discuss it. And probably in other MDT meetings, you know, the, the focus is on how do we treat this patient as effectively as possible. And so there is definitely cases of if you have a biallelic CIP alpha mutation, you don't have a FLT3 mutation and you don't have an NPM1 mutation, let's say. You know, at, at our center, those patients would go on to be tested and screened for uh, a germline variant. And the question is, is where in that journey of diagnostics does germline testing actually uh, start? And, and, and I think that, you know, people just are unsure um, because I think the, the robustness of uh, the information that we have means that you have to have appropriate germline material for comparison. And that's not always easy. And there's a suggestion that, you know, rather than taking, say, a remission sample, people would like to have uh, skin puncture and, and all these and then grow out fibroblasts from that puncture to actually have a, as pure a population of germline cells as possible. So it, it's it's complicated, but but the questions that that people have asked today, I'm very impressed because these are the things that we we have to be debating and we have to get into the psyche of everybody to say, when you meet an individual who's a, probably a young patient with AML, um, there is an exception. DDX41 patients can have a familial gene, but they they can present quite late. They can present in their 60s, but most others are, are generally younger. Uh, in a family with a germline C terminal CIP alpha, would you exclude a healthy sibling carrier for being a donor given the low penetrance reported? Well, I'm, I have the get out of jail card here. I am not a physician. I'm not a hematologist. I, I'm a scientist who's just worked in the field for quite some time. Um, I think that that if you can, I would, I personally would, would probably say that you would have to factor that into the equation. So if you have and these are rare. I've only ever seen, I've heard of three or four cases. We've won ourselves and one was published in, um, in Hematologica. Um, um, but the, the C-terminal mutation is yes, low penetrance. But I think if you're a carrier for a mutation, a mutation in a transcription factor, I, I don't think that that would be a suitable person for, a, for as, as a donor. I'd be looking elsewhere. But, but I think that there's a lot of other factors that you probably have to consider. But even with low penetrance, um, I, why would you consider using as a donor an individual with a mutation? It also raises the question of how quickly can you get these individuals tested? Because if you're going forward and you need to, to decide on, on, on a donor quickly, then you need a quick turnaround in relationship to getting these mutations tested and confirmed. And that's why, in a way, this combining of, of, of the genetic targeted panels, I think, is important because if you have to fill up a certain amount of the, the familial panel before you can use it, you have a delay. While I think you can turn around, potentially, these particular mutations very quickly if they're part of a, a larger targeted panel. Doing well. What tissue do you use for screening of germline variants? Blood at remission, oral swab? Thank you. Really good question. And so the difficulty is that when you, when you read, um, especially uh, Lucy Godley, who I, who I love, but you know, Lucy always talks in her manuscripts about getting growing out fibroblasts. And we've grown out fibroblasts from bone marrow cells, and it works really, really well. But you have to have bone marrow. It has to be fairly good quality, and it takes time. And I'm talking from a research perspective because we're not an accredited testing lab ourselves. We won't test these individual cases from a clinical perspective, only from a research perspective. Um, so, but any cases that we're happy with, we, we, we definitely would say a remission sample, you know, is, is not ideal, but actually I would rather test it for germline uh, a, a remission sample than test nothing at all. Also, I think if you have the possibility of doing segregation analysis, I think it helps. If you have multiple individuals in a family, um, by looking at and looking for that germline mutation, that N-terminal mutation in CIP-alpha in, in either multiple affecteds or, or affecteds and unaffecteds within the family, and that can tell you whether that mutation actually segregates. And, and you probably know because these, these N-terminal mutations are typically insertion mutations. They lead to 
this premature stop and the utilization of an internal ATG site. So in a way, you, you're, you're never confused as to whether these are polymorphisms or variants. Um, they're clearly uh, pathogenic mutations. Are there any recognized guidelines which is the best germline tissue to validate a variant? Um, I, as I said, I, I think that, that there's a needs must, but, but I would say that a, 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 a skin puncture, by all accounts, is the, would be the gold standard. And then you would grow out fibroblasts from that puncture, extract DNA, and that would be your, your, uh, that would be your source of germline material. You could also potentially take. Uh, you could also potentially take. Um, um, you know, flow T cells from your preferred blood sample, uh, and that might be another source. But the gold standard, and uh, the gold standard would be would be the the, the tissue puncture. But, but as I said, I, I think that that there's something to be said for for utilizing a, a, a remission sample as well. And and in all likelihood, those cases will have a low VAF level of mutation if they have any disease in them at all. But that's not ideal, it's not standard, um, and it, it, it shows again the fact that, that um, we need to think very carefully in relationship to the requirements of actually performing these tests as effectively as possible. So I think that is, that's all the questions, unless there's any more, but, but they were really, there were a really good set of questions and, and really the right questions that we all need to be asking in, in relationship to how, to, how to, to effectively integrate testing of, say, query familial cases uh, in the, ro the most robust way possible. Thank you, Professor Fitzgibbon, um, and thank you, the audience, for for a great discussion. Uh, this is the last chance to ask a direct question to expert. Maybe there is still somebody who would like to ask. And I suppose the only the only thing I would the only thing I would add again is is I think that if there's if there's anybody who who has families or has an interest, please contact me or and, and I can either I can direct you to other hematologists or other groups who might be more local to you uh, in, in Europe, etc, who would have an interest. Um, because I, I think this is an area that's not going away and I think we need to, to make people as aware of it as, as we possibly can. Thank you very much. Um, I think it was a really comprehensive uh, presentation uh, with great discussion. Thank you one more time, uh, Professor Fitzgibbon, for, for leading this uh, session today. And thank you, um, audience, for your participation um, in the great discussion. And before we go, I would like to invite you to fill in the survey I will send you after this uh, webinar. It's really important for us because we can adjust um, to your expectations. And of course, please register to the upcoming webinars. Uh, the next one will take place uh, at the beginning of uh, December. And please subscribe to our newsletter. Follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn and Facebook. And uh, please, of course, uh, visit uh, Eurobloodnet's Edu YouTube channel where we publish all the webinar sessions. Thank you very much and see you next time. Goodbye, everybody. Take care.